Hello, and welcome to the Teleperformance 2024 Third Quarter Revenue. My name is George, and I'll be your coordinator for today's event. Please note that this conference is being recorded, and for the duration of the call, your lines will be in the listen-only mode. However, you will have the opportunity to ask questions towards the end of the presentation, and this can be done by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad to register your question. If you require assistance at any point, please press star 0, and you will be connected to an operator. The conference will be hosted by Mr. Olivier Rigodi, Deputy CEO and Group CFO, and Mr. Thomas McGregenbrock, Deputy CEO. I'd like to have a call over to Mr. Rigodi. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, George. Uh, good evening. Uh, good day to everybody. I know you are from a different place in the world. I'm really happy to present today. Uh, with Thomas, the Q3 figure for 2024 and the nine, nine months figure. So I'm going to, um, not to bother you with a disclaimer, but I just wanted to, uh, so I would say, make it clear that uh, disclaimer are available. What is the agenda today? The agenda will be the following. Uh, Thomas is going, uh, that joined us uh, uh, six weeks ago, is going to take, to give some um, pre-remark to on the highlight, give some information on the business performance, and I will finish with the financial performance, and together we'll be uh, ready for answering all your questions. Thomas, it's up to you. Thanks, Olivier, and good evening, everyone, also from my side. A warm welcome to our quarterly update. As Olivier said, it's really great to be back, and I'm looking forward to walk you through the updates on the business side and financial sides in the next hour or so. As I've been now back for six weeks uh, within TP and traveled quite extensively across Europe, North America, and especially Asia, I can really say after all these meetings and visits that the entire TP team is fully energized and committed in achieving our goals and driving the future development of the business. Yes, the opportunities and challenges are real. But I do believe and I'm very confident that TP is operating from a place of strength and quality. We have built a very resilient global delivery platform backed by incredible people around the world and advanced tech capabilities and deep expertise. This position, and you will see this now in the following chart, will allow us to be really a net beneficiary in this changing world. I have to say what again and again really impressed me was this incredible enthusiasm that I've seen both from our teams internally and our clients. Inside the company, and you will see this later also in some examples, is that we are really embracing change and new technology, not just in theory, but actually on the ground and in the operations every day. On the client side, I have to say after these last weeks that every conversation I've had so far has reinforced the notion that our clients see us as a trusted and reliable partner in their transformation journey, that one that can support them not just on their efficiency, but also on their quality at the same time. As we move forward, we will continue to leverage vendor consolidation. I feel confident that we are in a good spot to deliver even more complex solutions across the entire value chain. And finally, we had also several conversations with our investors, and I had the chance to connect with many of them during our recent roadshows in the UK and the US, and we're taking your feedback to our heart. Trust us, we will continue to build a leading company in the tech-enabled B2B services space, and change has been a constant for us over the last 46 years and will continue to be so in the future. What does this mean now to our real numbers? And to give you some highlight of what has happened in Q3 2024. We have seen accelerated growth momentum year over year in Q3 with 3% growth, former growth and a reported growth of almost 27%. What's important to note is that we've seen gains across every operating region in our core services, really supported by growth in our key verticals, whether this is banking, retail, technology, or travel. And we also have seen a sustained momentum in our specialized services. The Majorelle integration is well on track and in line with our expectation. 
It's really great to see the teams working together, and we will provide more details about the integration process and the synergies when we publish our annual numbers, as this is just a quarterly update. As you have also seen in our press release at the end of August, the new governance is now in place. And on a personal note, I have to say that the collaboration with Muley Afit and Daniel is really outstanding and it's really a joy to work with them together. Last but not least, our guidance. You see me <laughs> smiling today. We're very happy to confirm our guidance for 24. Our performer growth will be around 2 to 4 percent. We see margin enhancement and really a sustained uh, enhancement and growth of our net free cash flow. More details will be provided later by Olivier. So that's essentially the highlights for Q3. Before we dive into the details, let me give you some high-level overview, which I think is important to understand what makes us unique. As I said before, we are a digitally integrated B2B services company. We are a transformation partner for more than 1,400 clients worldwide, working directly on the ground to make an impact where it matters most. What's important is that we bring four key elements together that drive these positive business impacts. People, process, technology, and expertise. We are really one of the few truly global large-scale B2B delivery platforms with nearly 500,000 talented team members around the world, and we are proud to bid this talent deeply in our client work. Secondly, process excellence. Delivering results demand process excellence, and for decades this has been a defining strength of our company. The methodologies, the programs of TAPS, BEST, and TOPS ensure that we deliver this progress uh, around our clients in all verticals. Thirdly, technology. Technology was always an integral part of our delivery solutions, but it is not a standalone product. It is something that we embed in our processes that allow us to augment and enhance our operations, and we have built a AI-enabled suite of several TP applications that allow us to deliver better results for our clients. And fourthly, domain expertise. Our clients, and we see in this in particular now for many years, but also in particular in this year, as you will see in a second, look for increasingly specialized complex services. And we believe providing this kind of complex service with our deep client relationships is something that will continue to thrive the business going forward. Let's take a look now what happened along this four dimension in Q3. We have continued to invest in our people, setting up a global firm-wide upskilling program in AI, so on the technology side, but also in EI on the emotional side. By the end of October, we have completed more than 44,000 training programs on both dimensions with our experts around the world, and we will continue to roll out this program in the coming month. Second processes. The well-established process excellence programs within TP of TOPS and PEST have been updated to include elements of AI and EI in these process excellence programs. The first pilot countries have implemented this. We are refining now the feedback, and we will roll out these, progress, these programs um, in the coming month for the rest of the organization. This is something that shows how we hone our process capabilities, embedding new services along the way. Technology. In Q3 alone, we have launched and implemented more than 160 new AI projects for more than 130 clients. This is a significant upgrade to our developments, what we have seen in the first half of this year, and we continue to invest in this element. In fact, our AI applications are increasingly built on a cloud-based architecture that it would allow us to implement them as microservices in our client operations. And lastly, domain expertise. What's interesting to see is that, in particular, in complex 
back-office-related solution, we also saw in the first nine months of this year double-digit growth, and we will continue to build on this momentum that we see in this vertically integrated end-to-end -end solutions. How does this performance look now on the development in the different regions? The acceleration in growth year over year in Q3 is across EMEA and APEC, as well as across the Americas. As you can see here, for the Q3, we have grown in EMEA APEC close to 3%, 2.8% to be precise. And also in the Americas, where we see some challenges in the first half of the year, we are back to positive growth of 0.3%. And as you might remember, in our half-year numbers, we saw Americas down by minus 1.7%. This growth is true in particularly for our strong offshore locations like in India, Africa, but also Latin America, as well in our multilingual hubs in EMEA, as well as also in the UK. Same story is true with specialized services. We see there a sustained growth momentum, pretty much in line what we've seen in the first half of the of this year around 11 to 12 percent, and we see some cross-selling activities also between the different specialized services lines that we have in place. Second topic, and we talked about this before, how do we see the vertical development? And here, obviously, a big advantage of teleperformance is a broad, diversified client portfolio. We see a strong development in particular across banking, financial services, retail, technology, travel, and automotive. So it's a wide range of clients who support that momentum, and this is true for EMEA and APEC as well as the Americas. Same element, the resiliency of the businesses, our broad business lines. As I said before, we see very strong growth momentum, in particular in specialized services, as well as in our BPO solutions. This is true in EMEA and APEC in particular, but also in India, where we have a very strong capability in more vertically integrated solution. Our care element, which is a little bit more than 50 percent of our business portfolio, has grown in the first nine months in line with our overall growth. To give you, as I now spoke about it a bit, what does it mean to build a more complex service landscape for our clients? We brought for this presentation one case example as I visited the operation in India and the Philippines a few weeks ago. And it, I think it really shows as a good example how we are able to combine domain expertise, strong client partnership with our process now on tech capabilities. This is a large client in the banking space. We have been working with that client now for more than uh, 18 years. Started historically on the traditional front office line in the retail sector, but over the years have expanded our business scope with that client to 14 business, to 14 business line and expanded our geographical scope from one location now to providing services also out of Asia and the Americas. What's interesting is that our process excellence has basically allowed us to gain a broader scope, not just focusing on the front office, but also on complex back office tasks and provide today an end-to-end -end customer lifecycle management across accounts, loans, payments, and fraud management. We have also successfully embedded several digital solutions on our process landscape with that client, leading to better outcomes for the clients by enhancing our colleagues with the right tool set, starting from training over operations, knowledge management, and analytics. And this combination of our four elements have really yielded to significant growth in the last years that we also hopefully continue in the future. So with that, I now hand over to Olivier to talk a little bit about our financial performance. Olivier, over to you. Thank, thank you, Thomas. I'm going to, um, to enter much more in detail in the figures that have been uh, presented by, to you by, um, by, um, by Thomas. So let's go on. 
Uh, if you look at the figure, uh, of course, uh, the first thing is that we, re we are reporting a 20, close to 27% growth in, in the Q3, in line with what we have said uh, in, in nine months. What is interesting is a 3% growth in like for like uh, for, the, for the quarter. More interestingly, that this 3 percent, which is exactly on track of what we, we were uh, thinking, telling to the market, is a trend. I'm sure you remember that in Q1, we were just growing at 0.9 percent, in Q2 at 2.4 percent, and now we are 3 percent, showing this acceleration that was weighted all along the year. Let's go much more in detail in the figures themselves. I just wanted to highlight two, two points on this slide. Of course, uh, we are bridging the figure of last year to the of this year, sorry. Uh, of course, you have the major uh, impact that is uh, for, for the nine months. Two things are interesting. Uh, the currency effect of 112 million, that is negative by 112 million, and the, of course, the pro forma growth, which is 155 million ahead of last year. If you take the currency effect, you will discover that the impact in the Q3 has been more important than it has been in the first half. As an example, uh, we were uh, having a, a Q3 impact of 77, 77 million negative, which is mostly due to two major, uh, I would say, currency, which are the Egyptian pound and the Turkish lira. Beyond this figure, uh, which are difficult, if, of, of course, to predict, it's uh, ring a bell. It gives some, some, some clues. It, it gives the, inf the, the information that teleperformance is aggressively uh, moving more offshore, including in Egypt and in Turkey, beyond India, that is already existing, and Philippines and Colombia. So this is a, 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 real, a real change. On the profama growth, what is interesting is that, of course, we are growing by 2.1%, 155 million. But more interestingly, I'm sure you remember that in H1, we were growing uh, at 83 million. We, so we have grown in the quarter more than close uh, more than, than, uh, than, than the first half. Not exactly more, but close to. We were growing at 83 million for the first half, and we are growing at 72 million in, in the quarter, showing this trend that has been explained by uh, Thomas of the acceleration. This is shown here. Again, the acceleration in revenue growth is exactly as expected, and we are going to confirm, uh, we already did, uh, the full-year outlook of uh, 2024 between 2 and 4 percent. That gives some credibility to this guidance trend. Let's move now on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on what is, how this growth is made in, in, in the nine months. First of all, Nothing changed dramatically, in fact, that the growth is driven always in Q3 and for the nine months by specialized service and EMEA in APAC. But what is interesting is that the core service, which was negative in Q1, uh, minus 0.9, growing by 1.1 percent in, in, in Q2, is, uh, is now growing at 1.6 percent, showing this trend that has been explained by the Thomas a minute ago. And this is true either for the Americas and, and for EMEA and APAC, while in the meantime, Specialized service continuing its growth at a double-digit figure uh, as, uh, uh, since, uh, since the beginning of the year. This is the, the main story that you have to, to keep in mind. Specialized service de delivers a, a double-digit figure growth, while Americas and EMEA and APAC are now growing back uh, again uh, significantly in Q3. So that leads us to what we are going to tell about the market for the, next, uh, for the end of the year. We are absolutely confirming our pro forma annual growth between 2 and 4 percent. We are also confirming our uh, EBITDA margin improvement by 10 to 20 basis points on a pro forma basis uh, before non recurring item. We are absolutely confident that we will have a sustained growth in net free cash flow, which is a key issue for such a company, for such company. We do believe that we have a very robust balance sheet with leverage, which will be less than two times EBITDA. And lastly, for those who are interested, uh, we have both continued to, both, to buy back some shares, meaning that we are today at 167 million, nearly 3% of the shares that have been bought since the beginning of the year, of which 50 million in Q3, showing roughly a 400 million return to, cap, uh, to capital to shareholder uh, since the beginning of the year. So now I turn back to, uh, to Thomas, and we will be ready to take questions after. As you see... <laughs> Our whole organization is mobilized to deliver our results. 
and we are very happy to reiterate our guidance with confidence. The industry still presents challenges, obviously, but also opportunities. But we believe there is a clear flight to quality, and we as TP are a net beneficiary of this trend due to our size, global footprint, capabilities, and breadth of service. We want to take advantage of vendor consolidation and will remain disciplined on prices while continuing to adapt and enhance our global delivery model. We have built, as Olivier just said, a highly cash-generative model, and we will continue to invest in technology and people to embrace more complex engagement and to be really a reliable partner for the client transformation and an AI enabler embedded in the processes that we deliver. The integration of MageRail is on track, and on a personal note, I can see that I'm very delighted how the former Majorelle colleagues work together with the TP colleagues around the world to make our business stronger. We are very happy to take your questions and are open for the Q&A section. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Also, make sure your line is not muted until your signal reach your equipment. Our first question will be coming from Will Kirkness, calling from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I've got three, please. Um, firstly, just on the exit rate, can you give us any help on how sort of September, October has looked and, and confidence in Q4 being above 3%? Um, secondly, was there any impact on organic growth from hyperinflation? Um, and then lastly, I just wondered if you'd be able to talk about that 3% like-for-like -like growth in terms of gross wins versus churn. If you go back to the FY23 presentation, you'd helpfully shown, I think it was 13% gross wins at the time, offset by 8% churn that delivered you 5% for the year. I just wondered if you could do a similar exercise for Q3. Thank you. So let me start maybe with the trends that we see for Q4, and then I hand over to Olivier. So as you know, Q4 is in our industry typically the strongest quarter, and the ultimate lending this year will essentially depend how the business will develop in November, December, as we have seen typically stronger demand uh, around the year-end festivities. I would say we are very confident in our corridor. The ultimate lending will depend on essentially the demand in November and December. As far as impaired inflation is concerned, there is very few impact in Q3. In fact, it was a little negative versus last year, but nothing material. Uh, and we'll see what will happen at the end of the year. As you know, it's always difficult to predict but because it's a uh, it's a mix of uh, inflation rate and uh, exchange rate, so it's difficult to predict. But I suspect there will be no big impact in, in, in Q4 today. Uh, as far as uh, the, um, the breakdown of uh, the churn versus newbies and, uh, and everything, I think it's better to wait until the end of the year uh, to, 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 to give you much more information uh, about that because uh, the, the nine months are interesting, but what is more, much more interesting is to have a view on the full year, and we'll do that at the, at the full year result uh, uh, end of February. What we can okay, say, though, yeah, so maybe that's helpful as a, a data point, that we see our pipeline for new business at this point in time stronger than as it was a year ago. So, yes, there's some volatility in the market, but overall we are looking at a stronger pipeline as of today compared to the same situation a year ago. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to Suhasini Varanasi of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good evening, Olivier and Thomas. And, uh, Thomas, it's good to speak to you again. Um, yes. Just a couple from me, please. Um, just to clarify from the previous question, do you still expect an improvement in organic growth versus Q3 levels in Q4? Um, the second question, 
is on core services and DIBS. Um, while it has shown improvement uh, versus Q2, it's probably a little bit slower than consensus expectations. So just want to check, are you happy with the level of improvement here? How are conversations with clients evolving? What are the major pushbacks that you're seeing so far? Um, and the last one um, is just on the run rate of synergies. Is it possible to give some color on what's the run rate of synergies achieved so far from the major role integration? Thank you. So if you do the math, <laughs> as we will be end up in, in reconfirming the guidance, it will really depend how November, December end up uh, with the final calculation for our Q fee growth rate. I, you see me uh, sitting here confidently, but as, as, I, as we know each other for quite some time, I always want to be prudent and not promise that I don't know yet. And we will know in um, eight weeks from now how ultimately the year has ended, and then we are very happy to share that with you. So please bear with us on that one. But I think we see a good momentum in the business, and it will ultimately depend on more macro demand uh, in November, December, how ultimately Q4 will end. Second question on general trends in the industry, yes. What we really saw in last month is a demand or a continued demand for efficiency that also leads to stronger demand in offshore locations, even moving from onshore locations to more offshore locations. This has obviously, as you know, an impact on our top line development, and we see this trend continuing. Um, if you look at our um, vertical, uh, sorry, our geographical development, as I mentioned before, we saw strong growth demand, in particular in India, uh, for the U.S. market, for instance. But this means, on the other hand, or in Africa, that our onshore demand in U.S. domestics as well as in continental Europe is in a more um, it doesn't has the same growth momentum. So that has a certain dampening effect on our top line. Uh, and also has obviously some ramp down and ramp up costs. Secondly, what I think is also fair to say that on new businesses, we typically see smaller deal sizes. Yes, there is new business coming in, but the very large deals we might have seen in previous years are not something that we have witnessed in the last month. Maybe I can tell a word of the synergy. Uh, nothing new since uh, we uh, issue our Q or H1 result, uh, except that I say that at that time that we were working on additional uh, uh, synergy, we are still working on it, and uh, we hope to be able to, uh, to make it clear uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, to, anyway, we will make a, a clear point at the end of the year, uh, early, uh, early March, end of February, when we will uh, announce the result. Thank you for your questions, ma'am. We will now move to Remy Guedenu, calling from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, good evening, and thanks for taking my, my questions. Just a few on my side. Um, you, you, Thomas, you've, you've, you've talked about vendor consolidation a few times during your introductory remarks, so I just wanted to, to uh, uh, I just wanted to pick your brain on, on what you think would be the opportunity there if the market has experienced any shift recently in that sense, and if you believe that that consolidation is likely to accelerate, and what's what the kind of time frame for, for that to, uh, to materialize, if, if there is any specific discussion with clients which makes you more, more confident on that. So that's the, the, the first thing. Uh, maybe the second thing, the second question, which is linked a little bit with that same theme, but it's on the, the commercial pipeline, so interested in understanding uh, where these new contracts that you're seeing are coming from. If this is, this is coming from competitors for the first time at sourcing, uh, grow from vendor consolidation as just discussed, so that, that would be interesting as well. And the last one is on um, uh, the previous comments you made on 2025, saying that you expect the momentum next year to be better than 2024. So just wanted to uh, make sure you're thinking to, to that comment and if you've got it, any more visibility on that or any more confidence on what, what could be the, uh, the level of organic growth next year? Okay, so many questions. <laughs> Let's start with the, with the easy one. So we're not providing any guidance for 2025. As always, we will do this when we um, uh, announce our full year results then end of February. What I can tell you today, and we are still in the midst of the process, uh, of our budget process for next year and of gathering all the data that based on today, our pipeline for new business is stronger than a year ago. That leaves me – is one indicator how next year will develop, but it's not the full indicator. And I really um, 
try always in my exchanges to be prudent and diligent. So let us do our work in the next weeks and months, and then we will give you a clearer picture at the end of February how we see 2025 uh, developing and landing when we provide the guidance. Yes, there is a lot of movement in the markets. As I said, bond consolidation is one trend. More offshoring is one trend. Um, supporting clients with technology and process know-how is one trend. Yes, we have some price pressure, even though we, as one of the leading players in the industry, we believe more in quality than uh, giving discounts. We see automation, but on the other hand, also demand for new areas. That's what I gave the examples for, for the back office-related task. We believe net-net we will be a beneficiary because there is, and that's I really believe, and that's not a new trend, a flight to quality. Vendor consolidation is not something that is just happening this year. It's a trend, I think, that's been going on now for several years. And as we are one of the leading players, I think we have been known for quality for many, many years. We have now a very complete global delivery platform. We have super engaged uh, colleagues and teams that really try to drive technology into our processes day in and day out. So I, I see a lot of energy and enthusiasm, and this quality that we see in our delivery is something that is also thankfully recognized by clients that we believe in this delivering good service, good quality, good technology solution. We can drive that momentum in a difficult market in some areas. We are not seeing the same growth rates that we saw during the COVID years, but we believe if we are focused on the business, we continue to see this momentum that has also been witnessed now in Q3. So that's why it's not a clear-cut answer to your question, but I really do believe if we focus on the core ingredients of our business, we have the right momentum as being one of the leading players in our space. And I also do believe by broadening our scope so not just focusing on CX, but on more back office related, one office related complex tasks, we see a lot of positive growth opportunities in the future because the capabilities that we have shown with our client, and that's why I brought the case example, it's amazing to see how you can have a real impact with client and grow with the client if you excel on the operations. And that's, I really believe there's plenty of opportunity out there if we excel on the delivery and driving impact for the clients that this opens up a, a much broader space to deliver our services. Any follow-up questions? Sorry, I was a little bit... Uh, <laughs> long, long question, long answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We will now move to Antonin Baudry of HSBC. Please go ahead. Yes, good evening, everyone, and thank you to squeeze me in, and thank you very much for this detailed presentation. Uh, two questions. You, you seem to be comfortable with your Q4 uh, target range, which could suggest a new acceleration of your revenue growth. I would want to know what makes teleperformance different compared to your main competitors that communicate more or on an additional pressure on both revenue growth and margins. My, my second question is about the impact of artificial intelligence on your uh, business model. You, would it be possible to, to split between volume and uh, automation uh, on your revenue growth in, in, in Q3, the growth of volume on the dilution related to automation, and if you saw some, uh, some change related to the penetration of artificial intelligence in your, uh, in your offer? Thank you very much. Uh, at some point, sorry, uh, follow up. On so, at some point, uh, do you think that you will come back to us with mid-term guidance of revenue growth on margins when you, the VBT will be uh, will be higher? Thank you. Okay. Let me take the first two and then uh, hand over to Olivier. So, uh, to be honest, I. I don't like to comment on competitors. We focus on our own business. We believe if we provide a good quality delivery and service uh, and provide uh, benefits to our clients, then the business will thrive. That's what we focus on. We will see how we end in Q4, but that's the only focus that we have, and I see uh, the momentum in the business, no? full stop. On the effect on automation and AI in the future, yes, it will has an effect. Uh, obviously, that's why we need to change. But if you look back this year, the actual impact on automation, and we try to 
to assess this with the teams and taking samples uh, for the first uh, for the first nine months, it is not as big as you might think. Um, so yes, automation exists. It's also being nothing new in our business, and it continuously drives efficiency in our operation. But of, I would say, equal importance is, for instance, the trend to offshore locations to drive also efficiencies that have a negative impact on revenue. The same thing if you drive um, sort of uh, pricing in some areas driven to automation has also an impact. So it's not that we see massive uh, impacts on our revenue due to AI in, in automation at this point in time, not beyond what we've seen uh, before and equally important, I would say, than some of the geo uh, relocation in the business operation. For midterm guidance, I think it's too early to say, but Olivier. Maybe, maybe of course, it's too early to say, uh, to tell, and, and probably we, uh, decision has not been made, but what is more interesting is to see whether will be above the market, and probably we will uh, make a uh, uh, with a guidance if we decide to make one uh, to see versus the market much more than in real term. So it's too early to make the decision, but this is probably something that uh, might, be, uh, might be the solution at, uh, for, for, for next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move to Carl Green of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Good evening to you. Um, I've got three questions. Uh, firstly, just in terms of the strong growth uh, you've referred to in language line solutions within specialised services, just thinking about uh, the, the margin as we move through the second half. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of moving parts within specialised services, and I think you've been seeing good operating leverage historically from the recovery in TLS contact. But just thinking about that skew towards language line solutions, does that suggest that in the second half we should be looking for kind of similar rates of, of margin expansion to what we saw in the first half within that particular division? That's my, my first question. I'll probably take them one at a time. Okay. Okay. Do do? okay. No. Uh, um, what we see is, of course, the language line solution is continue to deliver very good figures, either in terms of sales and either in terms of margin. And we do believe that in the second half, uh, LLS will deliver the same, same type of margin that it delivered last year. That it delivered last year. Okay. That's helpful. Um, the, the, the second question, um, just on the uh, – again, Olivia, you, you, you talked about the, the expansion in, in, in Turkey and Egypt and how that had led to a greater uh, FX drag on the top line. Again, uh, just a very basic question here so I understand uh, what's going on in terms of the commercial structure. Um, when you're seeing the, the offshoring, um, how many of the new contracts are – getting remunerated in local currencies rather than, you know, say, for example, having a, a German client where you've been billing them in euros, but your cost base is in Turkish lira. And again, you deal with the hedging, the transactional hedging behind the scenes. But in terms of, you know, the expansion of the, the offshoring arrangements, are, are you seeing more of the uh, invoicing in those lo local currencies, which would explain the greater FX hit? I'm, I'm just kind of struggling with, you know, the, the, the impact on FX versus just general deflation around offshoring. If I may, it's a, it's a complex question. As always, in FX, you have two issues. One is translation, one is transaction. Uh, what, what I just wanted to highlight in this Q3 is the fact that probably most of you have not uh, imagined that such an impact could happen in, in Q3 on the on, on a translation uh, figures, uh, which is the case. I'm not too sure it changed dramatically versus uh, previous year or on the invoicing, uh, in the invoicing uh, stuff. But, but part of the story has moved to, to this, uh, to this, uh, to this, um, to this country as a whole. Um, so the main story is, of course, the transaction, and that is much more complex to uh, to, to to predict. But of course, it uh, most of the time is helping the margin for for the group. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, and then, lastly, um, I just wondered if you've had um, over the last few days uh, any opportunity to, to look at any of the policy suggestions from the from the Trump camp. Um, I seem to recall back in 2016, there were suggestions that uh, a border adjustment tax on services might be applied to some cross uh, cross border services, such as. CX. I mean, have there been? I mean, I've certainly not spotted any from where I'm sitting. But have you guys encountered any suggestions or policy proposals which would give you sort of cause for nervousness? It's really. 
So I think that, no. No, frankly, uh, no. frankly it's too early to, to comment uh, uh, on that. Mm. No, what, 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 what maybe could be highlighted, because uh, we saw uh, again today the drop in the European market while the U.S. market was climbing, I just wanted to highlight that close to 50% of our business is coming from the U.S. market. And it seems curious to see that our stock will be down in Europe because we are listed in Europe while uh, half of our business, close to half of our business, is, in, is coming from the U.S. Just a point I just wanted to make. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, sir. Our next question will be coming from Nicole Mannion of UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my uh, question. I just wanted to ask about the AI projects that you mentioned in uh, your remarks. I think you said 160 new AI projects for more than 130 clients. How should we sort of think about that? So obviously, that sounds like quite a big number. Um, you know, are these sort of additional services that you're launching within clients? Are you automating stuff that you already provide? Um, yeah, I mean, how dilutive and, and you know, what sort of you know, penetration in, in the clients where you are launching these projects are you seeing? Just any more detail on those points would be really helpful. Thank you. Hi, Nicole. So oh, we're trying, still trying to figure out what's a good metric to show yeah. the AI impact on our business. The number of projects is something that we obviously consistently track, and it gives you an ex indication how the if there's an acceleration of adoption. And yes, we see that. So we have deployed more projects, AI, or in particular Gen AI projects in Q3 of this year than in the first six months of the year. So there's an acceleration. Typically, and as I uh, tried to explain before, it's not a standalone product, but we always try to embed an AI solution in our existing operations, working together with the client. And this is what we currently see. There's a momentum, relative speaking, to our client base that there's more willingness to try out things, to do a pilot project, to implement an AI solution. Um, to your question, to what is that the penetration in the market? So give us a little bit more time yeah. because some cases, I, as we have <laughs> sort of hundreds of projects now underway, how to there measure the impact. But I see that we are now beyond the experimenting status, but actually seeing in real life. And you see the impact either in more efficiency, better quality, higher customer satisfaction, depending on which AI solution is being implemented. And we will provide also beginning of the year an update on our AI solution space. As I said, we're upgrading them now to be based on microservices that could be quite interesting to make it more tangible how we actually deploy the AI solution in our clients' operations. So they are bear with us a bit, but I would say the message is we see an acceleration in interest in implementation it relative to the first half year. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Mannion. We will now move to Ben Wild of Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open, sir. Hi. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, three questions, please. Uh, at H1, there were, there were two very clear messages that you conveyed. Um, first, you were seeing first times of recovery in retail and tech, and you were driving good growth from new contract wins. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this quarter it feels as though your comments on these two themes are slightly more uh, muted um, sequentially. Do, do you feel as confident on the outlook as you did um, three months ago? And then a couple of questions on governance, please. In specialised services, the management team has been um, reshuffled with Scott Klein leaving Language Line Solutions. Um, what's the rationale for this change and, and, and the kind of impact within the group? And then secondly, uh, Thomas, you obviously left the group earlier in the year and, and rejoined six weeks ago. Can you give us any colour on, on that journey, um, how you see your, your new role within the group and, and your initial view having come back, back into the business? Thank you. Okay, let me start with the last one and then hand over to Olivier. And Scott Klein is still <laughs> leading Specialized <laughs> Services to avoid there any yeah. confusion. So he's uh, still the CEO of Specialized Services. Um, Yes, when I came back, and um, obviously it's an offer as being now the deputy CEO of the company, uh, I couldn't say no to, and it's being really excited to be back. I see a lot of um, positive excitement in the company, meeting old colleagues and new colleagues. 
And I would say it this way, if I would not be confident about the future prospects of the business, I wouldn't have come back. So I'm really, I really enjoyed immensely uh, the, the work and the collaboration with the team around the world over the last six weeks. It's been a tremendous pleasure. I see there's a lot of movement. Yes, the integration has made some steps forward and we're really there on a good track. But I see the company as a whole really on a path of of change and transformation, obviously working with the clients, but also transformation itself. And it's really exciting to be part of it. No, I, I can nothing as that. So I'm really looking positive into the future. And uh, we will be obviously in five years a different company than to now. And to work together on that journey is something that really excites me. Scott Klein, I asked, yeah. so he's still so, he's still president of Specialized Services. Yeah, just, just to be clear on Scott, Scott is now heading the wool specialized service as, as he did before, but as he's giving, it's getting more importance and more uh, is working on synergy between the different brands and different uh, company. He, he's taking the lead of the wall, uh, of the wall department, having somebody taking care only on language line uh, solutions. So, so it's not a change. It's, it's not, uh, he's not leaving the company by far. On H1, uh, of course, uh, we, we were uh, waiting an improvement in, in Q3, so we, we delivered it as always. Uh, we, we would have preferred to make uh, much more, but it's a very good figure as far as I'm seeing from the competition. And I do believe that uh, somewhere the question is uh, whether we are going to be in our guidance figure. And uh, I think you have understood that we will be in our guidance figure for the full year, that, no doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. We'll be moving now to Oliver Davies of well, it's an analyst. It's just simply Mr. Oliver Davies. Your line is open, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, a couple from me. I guess, firstly, in terms of the pipeline increase, is that being driven more by vendor consolidation bids or is that coming from, from new clients? And I guess within those, has there been any kind of noticeable trends in the competitors for them, those bids, um, and I guess your success rate? And then, secondly, um, you mentioned customer care grew in line with the group. Um, you know, BPO was double digit. So I guess, you know, where are the kind of weaker spots um, overall? Thanks. Sure. So let's start with the last question. Obviously, if we look uh, on the page, let me see if I can move back there. So care is very much in line with the group, back office is growing, where we see some, some um, and on the technical support side. So these are the two verticals where we are subpar uh, on the growth momentum compared to, uh, to the other verticals. Um, with regard to the pipeline, this is a new business pipeline, so it had nothing to do with our current business, so only talks about new business lines with new clients or new businesses with new clients. That's why I'm referring to, and this is also has something to do that we strengthened our business development capabilities and resources um, a few months ago. So we're ramping up there the resources and really investing in uh, building out uh, our business development capabilities, not just focusing on classical CX, but also on related business areas like uh, back office, uh, back office related work. Let's take uh, two okay, other questions. Sure. Next, please. I haven't heard sure about that. I just thought you were still answering. One more, please, sir. The next question today will be coming from Simona Sarli of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, good evening, and thanks for taking my question. Um, just a couple of them left. Uh, so, first of all, uh, a follow-up to the uh, share buyback program. So, you have indicated, Olivier, that since the beginning of the year, you have returned overall between dividends and share buyback more than 400 million euros. If I remember correctly, there was a commitment to return uh, two-thirds of the free cash flow generated in 2024, which potentially could still leave room for like 200 million more. So is there any plan to announce an incremental share buyback on the back of that? And then secondly, as a follow-up to what uh, Thomas had just mentioned around the two verticals that they are subpar versus the group, uh, can you provide a little bit more color on what is driving the weakness in technical assistance and trust and safety? Thank you. I'm taking the share buyback question, yeah. uh, leaving the other. Uh, if I remember properly what we wrote 
up to two-thirds. I'm not sure we've brought two-thirds, uh, to, be, to be precise. So we are at 400 million uh, euro. Uh, we, we are going to finish uh, the, um, the program till the end of the year. Um, decision has not been made as of today of what will be uh, the allocation of the capital for 2025. This, this, this is a, a topic of discussion, of course, with the board that is ongoing. And, um, and we will come shortly to you on, on this topic, at least at the latest uh, in February at the time of the results. With regard to the development on the trust and safety side, we do see an effect on automation, what we alluded to before. Obviously, in some areas we see an advancement of automation that has driven some of our, um, our business on the trust and safety side. And for the technical uh, support side, it's just the business development. So we focused on other areas and that has an impact on our growth momentum in that vertical, in that uh, horizontal uh, business line. Let's take the final question. Please, go ahead. Yes, sir. Our last question for the, the conference will be coming from David Serda of Kepler. Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen. So most of the question has been answered. So, so I have ju just a very basic question. So the high end of your of your guidance is, is quite impossible. Do, do you think that you will that the plus four percent for 2024 is still an achievable objective? Thank you very much. As said before, we, we have confirmed the guidance and we're very confident on that one. Where we will ultimately land will really depend on November, December. And typically, if you look at uh, past Q4 quarters, that has been the, the month where we see the highest growth and it will ultimately depend how will Black Friday, how will the Christmas season develop, uh, where we will ultimately land on this business. So this depends more on macro demands or end customer demands for the clients that we serve than our own doing. So they are bear with us, uh, and we will provide an update uh, very soon once we have this month locked in. But the business is going full throttle. We have to see where we end. So they are, um, let's bear with us a, a few more weeks and months. Thank you so much you for your interest, for all the interesting questions. Uh, looking forward to see yeah. you soon in four week, uh, end of February. At least. <laughs> At least. If there's anything in the meantime, please reach out to our AR department. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you very much in your interest in TP. Thank you. Good night to all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you and bye-bye.